Hi, everyone, and welcome. I uh, am very happy to introduce our president, Catherine Algor, who will say a few words and introduce our speaker. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Massachusetts Historical Society. And yes, I am Catherine Algor, president here. Thanks, Carol. Um, I'm looking at participants. We have quite a crowd. Well, you all esteemed people in the room. Lovely to see you. Uh, but also a lot of folks online and some, um, uh, I don't want to say old friends, but um, friends of long standing of the Historical Society. But I assume a, a lot of you have just come into this because you're interested in the topic or uh, a big fan of Professor Buell. Uh, so maybe you don't know who we are. And we are the Massachusetts Historical Society, the very first historical society in the Northern Hemisphere. And we're right here at 1154 Boylston Street, free and open to the public. Uh, so come and visit us. We have a, a collection of about 14 million manuscript pages, as well as portraits and arts, um, art and artifacts. And we uh, make them available to everyone, researchers, teachers and students, um, and members of the public who are interested in history. We like to say we have two and a half presidential libraries. We say that because it is true. We have John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and half of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, but really, the, the, the centerpiece of our collection are the millions and millions of pages of ordinary Americans throughout the 18th, 19th, 20th, and yes, 21st century. So we, um, we do a lot of the Historical Society. We do serve teachers and students through uh, History Day in Massachusetts. Um, we support researchers who create the historical narratives for the next 25 years. And we have programs like this. And we're able to do this because we have a wonderful set of donors and members. And for those of you who are in the audience, thank you so much for your support. You truly, as they say at the Oscars, make this all possible. But let's get to this evening's event. We are so thrilled to welcome uh, Lawrence Buell, who is the Powell M. Cabot Professor of American Literature Emeritus at Harvard University. He is considered one of the founders of eco-criticism and has written and lectured worldwide on transcendentalism, American studies, and the environmental humanities. He is the author of many books, including Literary Transcendentalism, The Environmental Imagination, Thoreau, Nature Writing, and the Invention of American Culture, Writing for an Endangered World, and a volume simply called Emerson. So please join with me in welcoming Dr. Buell to the podium, please. Well, thank you for that generous introduction and uh, thanks to all of you uh, near and far for showing up. Um, and I hope sharing my enthusiasm for uh, the book that I've just done. Uh, this is the first of various talks that I'll give about it. Uh, it's happening even before the official publication date. So you're present at the creation, that is creation at, of the marketing aspect of it. Um, this is uh, among my various books uh, over the past half century, by far the shortest. And one of those that I most enjoyed writing. Is there a correlation there? Something that uh, in uh, my advanced age, I should take to heart, maybe. Uh, but the book uh, developed from a happy convergence of several different things. Um, an invitation from my wonderful Oxford editor, um, the um, COVID moment uh, where we're all staying home and uh, we have to have a project, right? Um, and then the sense that this is an excellent moment to be writing the kind of book this is uh, about Henry David Thoreau. Uh, it is uh, the first short but comprehensive account by a single author of Thoreau's thought, life, work, significance in decades, really in almost half a century. Um, and it's 
it's a good read. It's not just for the tribe of scholarly specialists. It's written for uh, general audiences of varied interest. And most importantly, it's up to date. It's the first book to absorb uh, the explosion of new findings about Thoreau during the last decade about his life, about the political Thoreau, Thoreau the man of science, Thoreau the writer, Thoreau the thinker. Um, and it was a challenge and yet a great pleasure to synthesize uh, all that in, may we have slide two, please, the next slide. Yes, seven chapters, um, but all with tidy titles. Uh, three anchor chapters, you might say, uh, and then four on uh, specific aspects, uh, the writer, uh, the man of science, uh, the political thorough, and the spiritual seeker. And in this talk, what I plan to be doing is uh, scrolling out in a series five sets of reflections. First on Thoreau's claim to fame, uh, second um, capsule of his life, third uh, autobiographical a bit, why I wrote this book beyond what I said before. Um, then at greater length, some naughty issues that I try to address therein. Uh, and then finally, or maybe it's 4B, uh, some challenges of reading Thoreau's cranky prose, um, the uh, granular level. So number one, Thoreau's claims to fame. Um, may we have the next slide? Um, and may we have the slide after that? Um, we see a kind of diptych here, the historical Thoreau best uh, portrait, and the mythical Thoreau. Can we go back to the previous? Is that possible? Uh, from a daguerreotype of the mid-1850s, a bit after uh, Waldemus published. Uh, check out the tousled hair. Uh, usually these old portraits, uh, people try to be neat necks. Did Thoreau? No. Um, yeah, uh, this is the same as he was. Uh, now we can go to the next one. Um, and maybe some of you recognize that statue um, that's uh, in front of the uh, cabin of the Walden State Reservation. Um, it's uh, curious in the way that it shows him reaching out maybe to um, behold a specimen, uh, to exhort you. Um, or uh, to extend his own vision in some way, shape, or form. So um, the historical Thoreau and the mythical Thoreau, I put these uh, two up to start with um, because one of the key things to know and say about this chap is that he's one of the few figures in American literary history uh, to have achieved something like folk hero status. Um, I can think of only two others, uh, that Twain and Hemingway, um, despite his much tamer life than theirs. Um, and it's interesting that Ken Burns, the chronicler of all things uh, American, having done Twain and Hemingway, is in the process of doing Thoreau right now. Uh, so stay tuned. In a couple of years, that'll be uh, done and out. And um, I've been dragooned as one of the talking heads, but we can revert to that back in the in the QA if you like. Uh, so as I say at the start of my book, uh, Thoreau's one night in jail and two years of bivouacking in the woods near his home have taken on a mystique more durable than Lord Byron's philandering, Alexander Pushkin's duel, or Hemingway's hunting exploits. I stand by that. Um, maybe the Russians would disagree about Pushkin, but never mind that. They're not here and they're in disfavor um, stateside right now. 
So the witness to that would be the multiple legacies, the multiple lines of influence or impact that Thoreau has exercised over the years. Um, he's uh, an icon of voluntary simplicity. Uh, next slide, please. Um, his sister, Sophia, uh, sketched this very nice image for the title page of Walden. Um, and uh, if we go to the next slide, please, uh, we see the cabin replica uh, that's uh, just a little in back of the uh, statue that was shown before. Um, so the icon of voluntary simplicity lifestyle, um, the iconic civil disobedient, next slide, please, um, of Gandhi at his spinning wheel, um, Thoreau helped ignite Gandhi in the, the late 1800s. And I like this image, uh, even though it's sort of dorky, um, because it uh, shows the voluntary simplicity side of Gandhi, as well as, in a low key, the protest side of Gandhi. Spinning homespun was contrary to um, imperial policy. Um, Indians were supposed to supply uh, the mother country with raw material and then buy the products. Uh, but this is pushing back from that. Um, and the other line that's famous of uh, influence, uh, next slide, please. Um, a much more grand and mythic Martin Luther King, uh, for whom also Thoreau's civil disobedience was um, an influence. Uh, the term, by the way, originates with Thoreau, as far as we know, civil disobedience. Um, not the first title of his famous essay, but uh, the uh, version used in the second edition published uh, just after his death. Um, then, um, in addition, uh, voluntary simplicity, civil disobedience, uh, Thoreau's noted justly as a kind of pioneer ecologist, patron saint of modern environmentalism, father of modern nature writing. Uh, and we can go to the next slide. Um, if that looks a little grandiose to you, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir um, uh, on a mountaintop, John Muir um, ignited by Thoreau, uh, the founder of the Sierra Club, one of the founders of the Sierra Club, I think the uh, energy bunny. Um, then take the next slide and we see uh, Aldo Leopold and his uh, family, uh, conservation biologist of uh, the, the mid 20th century, uh, in front of their shack, uh, a recouped chicken coop uh, on a patch of, uh, abused Wisconsin land that uh, he helped to bring back and um, make famous in Sand County Almanac. Uh, Leopold's mother gave him um, the complete uh, thorough journals as a graduation present from college. And uh, it isn't as if that's uh, the only thing that got Leopold started on his path, but it's um, connective tissue, uh, a nice, um, more than coincidence of cultural history. Then beyond that, uh, Thoreau's uh, known as an iconic spiritual seeker, one of the early folk uh, who might be called spiritual, not religious, which some say is the um, commonest persuasion of folk today. Um, I uh, given talks uh, about Thoreau, other aspects where I've been sternly corrected uh, by somebody in the audience who says, you're all wet. Really, uh, the key thing about Thoreau was that he was a yogi or a sage or a guru. Um, and that he was or has been, is for some people. And finally, um, and maybe uh, most famously for uh, academic types. Uh, Thoreau is like one of the catalysts behind American literary emergence in 
the mid 19th century, the generation or generations along with Emerson, Emily Dickinson, um, Melville, Hawthorne, uh, that uh, riveted first the attention of uh, the import the attention to the importance of American writing abroad. Um, so how did all this happen? How did he do it? Well, uh, that's a complicated story, and you have to read my book in order to get the um, the gist uh, fully. But uh, clearly, the power to embody and dramatize action from principle uh, in uh, the books that most made him famous, Civil Disobedience and Walden, uh, the power to dramatize the difference that small steps can take. Um, and above all, and that's kind of drawing a ring around what I just said, the power of the pen, word power. Um, Laura's uh, best biographer, Laura Dasso Walls, <clears throat> puts it very well, I think, eloquently, uh, when she's writing about uh, Thoreau's uh, passionate defense of John Brown, um, the um, uh, guerrilla warrior who, um, after his failed Harper's Ferry raid, um, uh, really uh, ignited, uh, helped ignite the Civil War. She writes, John Brown's sword was impressive, but without the word, it was just a sword. And she has in mind um, the power of the word, of course, like Thoros. So that's a kind of overview of uh, the lines of, um, of fame, significance, accomplishment. Um, and we go to part two now, uh, a quickie biographical cameo for those uh, of you who would welcome that. Uh, I'm sure some of this will be familiar to you already. But uh, Thoreau was born in 1817, just as the uh, War of 1812 ends, and uh, just uh, in the middle of the year without a summer, um, that aberrant time caused by an Indonesian um, volcano exploding that was very hard on folks in the Northeast and throughout the Midwest. Born in Concord, uh, then a small town under 2000, but uh, in the process of being absorbed, soon to be absorbed uh, into Metro Boston during his lifetime um, with urbanization and industrial revolution. Uh, that story is best told by um, Robert Gross in his recent book, The Transcendentalists and Their World. Um, which uh, tells you everything that you need to know about Concord history, uh, believe me. Um, Thoreau's family was part of this. Um, the family had uh, a home industry, a pencil making business that flourished and morphed according to uh, this techno history that I've referenced. Um, from making pencils to graphite processing for um, new modes of uh, mass printing production and prospered. And Henry helped out by um, making a discovery about graphite processing that uh, gave the family uh, an edge. He lived in this town almost his whole life, uh, mostly under the same roof and family. After college, uh, swept up by the so-called transcendentalist movement, whose epicenter was Concord, Emerson, its key spokesperson. Uh, and can we have the next image? Um, this is uh, an image perhaps familiar to um, members of the Mass Historical Society um, and uh, um, all around Boston. Um, his family considered it the best image of him. Um, about uh, 1855, 1854, about the time that Walden was published, um, this picture was taken. Um, so Emerson is the catalyst of transcendentalism, uh, whose key doctrine, he said, and I think he's right, was the infinitude of the private man, uh, the God within. Um, 
And Thoreau took that on and took much else on from Emerson too. Um, Thoreau rejected a conventional career to become a freelance writer of iconoclastic essays and irreverent narratives of foraging around the New England region. Died early of the family curse of TB um, with most of his work, alas, unfinished. Um, and at that point, typed still as an Emerson clone, an Emerson disciple. Um, Emerson's friend, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the novelist and uh, Harvard Medical School professor and head, uh, said of Thoreau, uh, he nibbled his asparagus at the wrong end. Um, right. Um, and you can see uh, that uh, initial uh, difference frozen in stone. Next slide, please. Uh, with um, the monumental grave of Emerson um, with his two wives flanking him, uh, wives in succession, not um, simultaneous. Uh, and then next slide, please. <laughs> Henry's mark. Uh, it, it's nice, those little stones on, on top. Um, remember the stones on top book. Come back to that uh, very soon. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in the slide following, but don't show that yet. But since, um, since death, uh, since both their deaths, uh, as uh, the nature writer and Thorovian uh, Edward Abbey memorably puts it, the village crank became a world figure. And to the point of eclipsing uh, Emerson's reputation uh, and um, interest value uh, for the wider public, um, the wider world public uh, within the past uh, quarter century, if not further. Uh, point of um, of uh, demonstration here is uh, the uh, growth of the Thoreau Society since its birth in 1941 versus uh, the non-growth of the Emerson Society. Uh, the Thoreau Society has burgeoned into a, just a mighty force. Uh, well, that may be a little bit much, but uh, if any of you have attended its meetings, no, um, it uh, meets uh, for a whole week, practically, in Concord, uh, the week in July nearest uh, Henry David's birthday. Uh, and one of the things that's great about it is that it has uh, a large contingent of scholar types like myself, essentially, and then a large contingent of real people. Um, I think I probably qualify as that too, uh, an enthusiast, but uh, it's, it's a very cross-cutting and international group. Uh, the Emerson Society is anemic by comparison, much underfunded, and um, is hard put to do much of anything except occasionally meet in um, an upper room. Um, so today, if we go to the next image, uh, we see um, as one result uh, the memorialization of uh, Thoreau's cabin site at Walden Pond. Um, and that um, a sign, which I think most of you can probably read, but I'll read it out uh, just in case. Uh, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Uh, that's uh, from where I lived and what I lived for, that second chapter of Walden, the uh, kind of credo chapter of Walden, where uh, he lays out the inner and, as it were, spiritual reasons for what he did, as opposed to the uh, economic underpinnings of the experiment. Um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, that's the uh, verse view. Um, looking from uh, the hut site, the cabin site, to the um, pond itself uh, with the cairn of stones uh, that had been left by devotees 
actually, uh, it's a sort of pseudo Karen in a way uh, that started getting piled up, uh, oh, in the 1800s. And it's been taken away at least once in a misguided kind of rural renewal sort of uh, cleanup effort and then brought back a bunch of stones brought back for rubble. And now people are still adding to it today. Uh, if you haven't, take the opportunity the next time you go to Walden Pond, those of you who live near enough to, to go. Uh, so now a uh, third section, um, just a bit about uh, why I wrote uh, the book in addition to what I said before. Um, I had a sense of unfinished business uh, about Thoreau. Um, as a figure who has interested me deeply since youth. Um, but uh, I never felt that I had satisfactorily figured out. Uh, I'd always been drawn to um, writing uh, and thinking on the borderlands of literature, philosophy, religion, and social thought, intellectual prose, you might say. And so the transcendentalists, uh, especially Emerson and Thoreau, were on my radar screen early. Country Boyhood helped uh, a, a place which, like Concord, was in the process of suburban encroachment. Youthful cantankerousness helped. Um, maybe it was in my blood. Um, after I wrote uh, my book, uh, Environmental Imagination, I'm, I wish it had been before, my father fessed up and told me that his mother uh, a hundred years ago, before then almost, uh, had persuaded um, the other folk in her town after being ignited by Thoreau in her book club uh, to have a kind of tent city experiment in the hills during the summer. Um, it's actually true that documented that the uh, early Thoreau clubs uh, had a preponderance of women members. It's interesting. You can go figure about that. Well, it wasn't a successful experiment. Apparently, um, after a first day or so, it started raining cats and dogs. And then according to my father, his androcentric account, the husbands rebelled and you know, they followed their tents and went back home. But so I like to think, you know, I, I have some of that in my background. But um, all the while that I was teaching and thinking about Thoreau, uh, he felt more elusive to me than other figures uh, in the transcendentalist movement, including Emerson. Usually Emerson is considered the tough nut to crack, but uh, for me, it really was more thorough. Some of it was that, to my shame, uh, until the last three, four years uh, working intensively on this project, I never actually immersed myself in the total thorough stem to stern but chiefly in Walden and Civil Disobedience, the famous pieces, um, and other works more selectively and opportunistically. Um, and uh, I have since made amends. Um, it helped immensely that um, during the 90s and since, uh, a good bit of Thoreau that had remained in manuscript a very long time uh, has been published. Uh, but there still is uh, a good bit of Thoreau that hasn't been. There are frontiers available. Uh, so uh, I want to now turn to part four and 4A, or part four and five, um, some of the knotty issues that I try to address uh, in my book. And uh, I feel pretty good about how um, I have addressed them, though, uh, Maybe when you read it, you'll see that you can suggest improvements, um, which is fine. Uh, if you do, let me know. Um, one is how to reconcile the political Thoreau with the back to nature Thoreau. Confrontation versus withdrawal, those two impulses. And I thought about this for a long time, and I've written about it uh, in ways that didn't fully satisfy me. Um, and uh, I believe that I've come to a good uh, position in the book in the way that I regard them as two sides of the same genius. Uh, chapter six on the political thorough and chapter two that I modestly call essential thorough, 
that's wound around uh, civil disobedience in Walden, those two famous texts, um, they were the first to be written. Uh, and uh, I felt uh, it was important to have done that before doing anything else. And uh, what I felt I discovered for myself was um, that resistance um, for Thoreau really involves those two faces at the same time involves confrontation and withdrawal at the same time. You resist from the position of disengagement from the state, really. Um, and beyond that, uh, all these surprising uh, hooks between those two great pieces that are often published together and taught together, but rarely discussed together, um, both showcase the solitary just person opposing the warped social order. Both stress the necessity of freedom from material entanglements. Uh, the uh, uh, voluntary simplicity ethic uh, for um, Walden is really uh, presumed for the civil disobedient as well. Less baggage, more likely that you will have the freedom to resist. Uh, and then the um, commitment to the idea of personal experience as paradigmatic, um, the will to transform personal memoir into myth in some way um, that they share, and not just those two. Um, with civil disobedience, Thoreau casts himself as a kind of latter-day Antigone uh, resisting um, she resisted Creon, he's resisting uh, the powers that be uh, that have brought us uh, institutionalized slavery in the Mexican War. Um, and in um, Walden, uh, a bunch of uh, myths uh, superimposed on each other or coexisting. Thoreau as a archetypal backyard homesteader, do-it-yourselfer, um, hermit, recluse, sage, um, uh, whether you look at it as Eastern or Western. Um, in this way, uh, small deeds, and when you consider a single night in jail or two years of semi-camping in the woods, they're small, but magnifying them um, in reflection as to the importance of their stakes in the inward life and potentially the um, life of um, the society around you, if you're um, noticed and have impact. So that was one um, dimension that I worked on very hard and I felt pretty good about. Uh, then how to reconcile, if they can be, the poetic Thoreau and the scientific Thoreau, um, the quant and the qual. Um, and I had this intuition that the quantitative Thoreau was inseparable from the qualitative Thoreau, despite the tension between them on which Thoreau often remarked and on which my tribe of lit study scholars uh, tends to seize and say, oh yeah, um, surveying was just a day job for him. He didn't invest himself that much in it. Um, or uh, Science was something that he did uh, uh, with uh, his uh, breath held or his hands over his nose. Um, he wanted to do it in an old naturalist style way and not in a, uh, a new style man of science, uh, empirical research way. Um, there's a famous journal entry that uh, Thoreau um, scribbles from the 1850s where the American Academy for the Advancement of Science uh, sends him a form and asks him um, to fill out uh, this questionnaire, including what branch of science are you especially interested in? And Thoreau huffs about this in his journal. And he said, uh, I could only speak to this low um, mentality that they could understand. And um, come to think of it, I should have told him that I was a transcendentalist, a mystic, and a natural philosopher to boot. Uh, just saying that I was a transcendentalist, that would be enough to tell them they wouldn't understand the kind of work that I do. Right. 
But he did fill out the questionnaire dutifully. And he uh, said what his special branch of uh, scientific interest was, um, the uh, Algonquin peoples before the advent of civilized man, um, ethnography, in other words. And that was true to what he had done so far in uh, empirical research. He'd filled half a dozen notebooks with entries on that. He didn't continue. He moved over towards botany and geology and especially forest science. Uh, but um, it was uh, it was an authentic representation of uh, the empirical side of Thoreau. And conversely, uh, you can see Thoreau being very um, particular uh, about facts and um, precise in measuring his words. Um, and talking about matters of aesthetic in his journal, especially, um, he once said that uh, you can't really um, appreciate um, a landscape uh, without uh, a botanical eye. That's very interesting. Uh, only the botanist uh, can really do it. Uh, of course, you can't just be a botanist. You have to be uh, an artist. Um, so I came away thinking, um, as I put it in uh, one of the chapters uh, that I discussed this, uh, the two on the writer and the man of science, uh, that he was a kind of village Leonardo, uh, not just uh, natural history, not just uh, uh, ecology and botany and geology and um, ethnography, not just writing, uh, but uh, he was adept at singing, dancing, playing the flute, uh, carpentry, building boats, um, surveying. His uh, surveys were um, uh, acclaimed for um, their precision, and that was how he won back the respect of his um, townsmen, who initially thought he was a kind of deadbeat, a slacker for um, not doing the kind of stuff that Harvard graduates were expected to do in those days. Oh, could we have uh, the next slide, please? Whoops, my, my, my. Uh, I see that I have omitted a slide, uh, which was uh, the survey of Walden Pond itself that comes in page 200-something of Walden. And, um, literary scholars have often wondered, what the heck is it doing there? Well, um, the obvious answer is uh, that it relates to uh, a complicated uh, philosophic shtick that uh, happens in this chapter, The Pond in Winter, where he uh, seizes on the mathematical fact that the line of greatest breadth intersects with a line of greatest length at the, at the point of greatest depth in the pond and goes on about how this really is a rule of character, human character, as well as of um, limnology, uh, water bodies and the like. Uh, but he's also advertising his new um, trade, uh, which he is rolling out at the very time that he's uh, writing Walden. And he's very proud of uh, what he's done. So um, you can't separate those two sides. Um, so the other thing that I want to mention it, that I worked on hard was um, the question of the Thoreau-Emerson relationship. How could a disciple live in the master's shadow his whole life and yet become a major figure in his own right, eclipsing the master? Um, that's the core of that third chapter on Thor on transcendentalism and other backgrounds. Um, it's a really remarkable historical fact. There are very, very few cases since Socrates and Plato and Aristotle where that could be said, that the disciple emerges and becomes a figure of a stature to eclipse the um, previously um, world-famous master. Um, Part of the story that um, I think is pertinent here, I've told in a previous book on Emerson, the last chapter, on Emerson as anti-mentor, I call it. Uh, Emerson was a permissive, 
mentor. So he gave slack to this slacker and um, was willing uh, to have his uh, benevolent hand bitten by Thoreau um, uh, and have Thoreau go his own way. But um, the other part of it is Thoreau's capacity for thinking disobediently. If he hadn't been a kind of refractory guy to begin with, that never would have been possible. He never would have been able to put that kind of distance between himself and Emerson. There's more to this story. Read the book and you'll see the more. Um, I'm going to skip very quickly through 4B or 5, um, the granular part, uh, some of the challenges of reading Thoreau, and simply say this. Um, for me, they boil down especially to two. One is uh, what I call the two Thoreaus problem. Um, the discrepancy and the interweave between the historical Thoreau and the figure of Thoreau that his writing presents. Um, these two Thoreaus are both distinct and inextricable. I'm quoting myself. Uh, Therein lies the biggest roadblock to understanding either. The problem is compounded by the challenge of resolving either into a single image. The biographical Thoreau is a more than ordinarily paradoxical creature whose personality is as much disguised as revealed by the wealth of documentation, including the two million word journal that he kept. Um, so Thoreau watchers are repeatedly tempted to the extremes of premature closure or dithering equivocation. I like that, premature closure or dithering equivocation. Uh, nor does the first person voice in Thoreau's writing stand still. It oscillates between forthright and elusive, confidential and standoffish, lyric and sarcastic, polemical and ruminative, serious and sly. Um, it's tricky, tricky, tricky to read Thoreau. Um, I think that uh, passing over what else I might quote by myself and by him uh, to my last cruncher points, uh, what Thoreau's writing says to us, to you, um, beneath the surface, not always overtly. My thoughts are more complicated than my emphatic pronouncements. Thoreau is always one for emphatic pronouncements, and I, I love some of them. They're much beloved, they're collected by you know, uh, scholars and greeting card manufacturers both. Um, um, beware of all enterprises that require new clothes. That's one that I love. Um, never mind the rest. Uh, you will have your own list. My thoughts are more complicated than my pronouncements. Take me seriously, but not too literal mindedly, not too solemnly either. Um, or I'll evade your clutches. And then don't just follow me, use me to find your own way. Those really are the um, crystallizations, my words, not his, of the spirit behind the prose and, and no small measure I think account for the durability of it. And in that spirit, uh, I try to write my book. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, if you're tempted to look at it yourselves, you'll be ignited by uh, the same enthusiasm that brought me to it and kept me through it and still lingers by George, uh, even though I'm almost twice as old as Henry David was when he prematurely kicked the bucket. <laughs> um, so last uh, image or two, please. Um, And the next one, Walden Pilgrims on a Summer Morning. Um, who can tell what directions uh, Thoreauvian percolations take? Those Walden bathers, most of them, they don't give a hoot about Thoreau. They just come to refresh themselves. But they couldn't do it at Walden if it weren't for Henry. Um, 
because he loitered there uh, and made it classic ground. Um, the park happened because the park happened. There it is, uh, one of the greatest, one of the best bodies of fresh water accessible to a metropolis, and people use it, and they should. Um, and uh, so should we all. I, I hope that uh, one impact of this talk is to get everyone who's proximate to rush out to Walden, uh, ideally on a wretched weather day, so you can have the place yourself. So, thank. You. Thank you for listening. So I'd love to take questions. And uh, please, uh, for, especially from, uh, first of all, from those of you who are here, who showed up uh, bodily, uh, and then from uh, our virtual audience. And I hope that you won't be shy. Um, Everybody owns Henry David Thoreau, not just the experts, please. <laughs> um, my astronomer colleague, yeah. yes. Okay, I was just going to say, ask about the the travel books of Thoreau, um, the Merrimack, the Cape Cod, and Maine, and they're from the journals, I assume, basically, that they start out, but there's obviously a different kind of writing going on in those which seem much more accessible. Um, maybe because they're telling stories and the journal's not exactly doing that. But um, I'd like your thoughts on that. Yeah, I draw a distinction between A Week in the Concord and Mary Mac Rivers, his first book, and then uh, Maine Woods and Cape Cod. Um, a Week um, is uh, cobbled together pretty much only a little differently from Walden in the sense that it 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 does, it has, um, a mini journal that starts it, uh, but very, very sketchy. And there's a lot of backfilling of the narrative and then infilling of uh, a lot of essays that Toro wrote. Uh, so it's a loose and baggy monster, but a wonderful loose and baggy monster. Uh, it does uh, uh, fulfill, I think, the travel narrative um, template, uh, but differently from Cape Cod and Maine Woods, which follow uh, uh, narrative material that Thoreau got up uh, from the four trips to Cape Cod and three trips to Maine. So uh, there's more linear momentum in the two uh, later travel narratives, uh, um, Maine Woods and Cape Cod. Um, most folk, um, you must be a hero reader, but most folk find uh, a week uh, somewhat hard going, uh, a challenge. Uh, the other two, uh, they become classics uh, uh, of uh, early uh, write-ups of their respective regions, and for very good reason, I think. Um, I could say more, but let's go on, and, and we can circle back to that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I teach at a public university in Texas, and I usually do uh, freshman courses in history. And when I teach Walden, I'm surprised both by very few of my students who have read Walden. It doesn't seem to be assigned in high schools, at least in this region much. And as well as how hard the students take Walden, they, they have a hard time grasping it and they, they, they just don't really attach to it, which depresses me. But then a few weeks later, when we get to the discussing the 1840s, and 1850s in my class, and they read civil disobedience, their eyes light up. And that, that's the text that they find more attachment to. How do you see the the image of Thoreau evolving in society? Like, do you think the Thoreau of now is very differently understood than the Thoreau of, you know, 20, 30, whatever years ago? And what type of Thoreau do you think is going to be seen as enchanting to students and general readers in the future? Well, on the last, academics are terrible prophets. You know, we do much better with hindsight. Um, uh, as far as the, the evolution of, uh, of uh, uh, passion for those sides of Thoreau, um, it's interesting that um, the roads divide uh, um, shortly after his death. And in America, it's Thoreau, the writer of outdoor literature, as it was called, uh, that's salient. And um, in Europe, um, as with the young Gandhi, it's uh, the protest Thoreau. 
uh, then uh, they compete with each other as as time goes on. I think some of the pedagogical challenges is that Walden is long and it's uh, often pretty pretty thick. You have to uh, read it pretty carefully. I've sometimes said to myself, uh, I could write, I could teach a whole course where I'm, I assigned Walden every week or parts of it. Um, and uh, I think the recourse that a lot of people have um, fallen back on, and understandably, is to do bits and pieces of Walden. Um, and uh, maybe if you find your client's uh, eyes glazing over quickly, um, you could you could try some some a chapter, some passages, something like that. Uh, but civil disobedience, uh, that's uh, something you can hold in your hand much more easily. And uh, the um, the essay is, is much more centripetal. It's wound around uh, uh, the specific occasion and uh, packs that kind of wallop. So I think it's not surprising, uh, particularly uh, for students uh, who... Uh, are somewhat detached from um, uh, environmental embeddedness. Maybe they're city kids uh, for civil disobedience to speak to them. And maybe that's the way that um, Thoreau's uh, fortunes will go in the future. Uh, at the same time, uh, the uh, do-it-yourself simplicity experiment is something that's transposable, and it can be done in urban contexts as well as uh, as um, rustic, and that's something that you can get students to play with, at least, uh, even if they uh, are slow to admire the prose. So um, a few thoughts may be helpful, hopefully helpful. More. So we have some questions online. Yes. Rose asks, what elements of developing U.S. culture and society would you say Thoreau most detested, and what are the implications of his worldview for us today? Which did he most detest? Ah. He uh, detested bureaucrats, not just uh, political, but in every walk of life. And that's one reason why he was pissy about returning that questionnaire to the American Academy of Science. He thought, well, this is a bunch of scientific bureaucrats uh, engaged in management. So he had very little patience for that, very little patience for due process. Uh, he had very little patience for um, conventional religion. Um, he uh, derided his uh, dutiful church going neighbors as uh, the equivalent of Roman peasants going to, you know, worship the gods. Um, he had little patience for slackers, even though he himself was called a slacker, uh, but for people who didn't show up on time when they promised. Um, he had little patience for um, those who he considered uh, spoke in bad faith. You know, they uh, were one thing and pretended to be another. They said one thing but meant another. Uh, oh, hypocrisy was uh, anathema to him. If you want to get um, a short form version of Thoreau's pet peeves, uh, there's no better place to go than the late essay called Life Without Principle that he delivered. With uh, uh, he delivered as a lecture, and then it was published after his death. But those those are some of the examples. Now I have I've lost sight of um, what else uh, is in that question, which is um, the uh, net use value of Thoreau today. Uh, well, all right, I'll just uh, kind of reference everything that I just said, and say that everything that I just said. Uh, I think holds, maybe holds in an accentuated way for public culture today. Um, so maybe you don't want to go back to Thoreau uh, and fast forward him uh, to uh, address a political mendacity, um, greed, um, hypocrisy in any venue, um, the uh, stark discrepancy between rich and poor. Um, but 
you could. You could enlist Thoreau in any of those um, causes to very good effect, I think. So more, uh, any other questions, I hope. Nobody yes. should be shy. Uh, nobody should hide, if, even if you're online. So Andrea asks, uh, says the title of the book includes thinking disobediently. Could you say more about your use of the word disobedient? Yes. Um, I can start with uh, something that Emerson said about Thoreau in uh, his memorable uh, funeral address. Uh, I won't call it a eulogy because uh, he has some critical remarks to say about Thoreau, too including sort of this one, that there was something military in Thoreau's nature, uh, that he was always looking about for a blunder to pillory um, and seemed not to find himself except in opposition. Um, a stance, Emerson adds very suavely, um, uh, somewhat uh, dampening to the social affections. Um, so... This is a kind of um, embedded trait of character from Emerson's standpoint. And um, Thoreau did, did uh, as I said before, bite back against the master's uh, benevolence. He bit the hand that fed him. Um, but I think the larger point here, and maybe the uh, more important intellectual point is, Thoreau never took an orthodoxy for granted always held up, received wisdom for examination, sometimes withering examination. Um, this is the man who said, I've lived on this planet um, for almost 30 years, and I've yet to hear uh, the least syllable of good advice from my seniors, uh, something that I take to heart and mention every time I teach Thoreau. Right. Um, so those are some... Um, ways that I would answer that question, a uh, fair question. And uh, they don't. Uh, what I said doesn't exhaust, but uh, maybe that'll propel you further uh, to check out the book. I heard the bell. Does that mean, uh, Thoreau says in, in Walden, if the bell rings, why should we run? He's uh, referring to factory bells, you know, the noon hour, and, and then you have to show up at 8 o'clock or 6 o'clock, whatever. Uh, but yes, uh, it's the decorous bell. And There are no further questions, and I would like to thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Thank uh, you. And welcome folks in the room to head downstairs and buy a book. Thank you.